Hey everyone, welcome to uh, my next uh, edition episode of Ag Uncensored and back at it again with another, I'll, I'll say legend in ag or, you know, to to many different degrees with uh, Kip Pendleton. And uh, I reached out to him as I've, I've known Kip for, or I've seen, I've seen you around at conferences and shows since I was a, since I was a kid growing up in, in the ag tech precision ag world with my dad and you've known him for a long time and we know hundreds of the same people and you've been around kind of the the world in ag beyond just the tech side so thanks for thanks for being on and and uh happy to have you glad to be here i'm a, i'm a legend at least in my own mind nathan so we'll we'll <laughs> well you know that everyone's got to be a legend in their own mind at least i i, I suppose i Right now, with my my memes and stuff, that's kind of my my big trope of of legendary things, and and I'll, I'll bring up some crazy ideas too. But <laughs> Nathan, I share to people all the time: if you're not trying to be legendary and and leave a mark in ag and make ag better, you're wasting your time. So, legendary is a really good term. Well, and 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 in our state motto is in North Dakota: be legendary. So, I guess I'm just following what the state's telling me to do. I'm. I, I don't always listen to the government, but, you know, I'll, I'll listen to that part. So that is a strong progressive state. I love it. <laughs> well, I, I just put a uh, a post on, on LinkedIn the other day as, you know, and talking around ag tech, like we're actually the number one um, user percent wise, according to the USDA okay. surveys. And, and I brought up that, you know, a reason for that is, you know, we're just not, we're not just corn and beans. We're not just some of these things or, and there's nothing clearly wrong with that. You've lived around, you've seen cropping systems all over the world and, and we're kind of in a unique w world, but we have a lot of, you know, we have cold weather. We have not a lot of people. Uh, we have our own challenges and, and the technology has just kind of helped push through that. And uh, I would say I'm, I may be a little spoiled living around here and, and actually, right now there's an event at the uh, the Grand Farm, which is only yep. five miles away from me. I live really close to it, and so I'm going there after this. But you know, looking at everything from your history, you know, there, there's adoption problems, and we were kind of talking on it on the pre-call of of technology and ag is is great, and it can do all these great things, and people are trying and working hard, but something's missing, and you know, and yes, North Dakota is doing some great things, but we're not doing it perfectly either. You know, from, from your travels and, and work around, you know, or, or maybe before get into that, like explain a little bit more on, on how you've been in ag, what, what's been your part. And then maybe we, we can dive into more of that side great, of it. Uh, great question. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've, I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm a Champaign County, Illinois kid. I grew up on a farm. I thought Champaign County, Illinois farmers were the best in the world. What I learned, we had the best soils in the world. That's a distinct advantage uh, from that standpoint. But yeah, I've had a chance to progressively work across ag. I'm a, you know, a proud University of Wisconsin grad, used an agronomy and ag econ degree, and later an MBA in finance to, to really work across ag in a number of areas. I started and worked 20 years in the seed industry, which gave me a real grounding of how technology can change a commodity section of an industry and how technology can really improve returns and how technology can make uh, farmers more effective and even change their lives. Because uh, much of what ha has happened in the seed industry has done that uh, from that standpoint. I progressed, I, I kind of follow bell curves, right? And the, and the next big bell curve was what are we going to do with information and how does influence, how does information influence biotech seed crops and how do you use those and how do you measure those? And what I found is you got to find ways to move data. So I focused in information and data and, and the way that data is collected is through precision uh, equipment. And um, that allows you to do some things. And then I've now kind of progressed to, I think the next big value area in ag is, is biotech. Uh, Mm -hmm. biological biotech um, yeah you can you can call it digital biology i think is our fourth uh curve changing forward and and digital biology is taking all the things we can do with data in the human area and applying it to agriculture and the reason i'm interested in that is because the way we've developed 
synthetic chemicals and the way we've, you know, now uh, regulated them, maybe good, maybe bad, but it's almost cost uh, ineffective or cost prohibitive yeah. to bring forward a new chemical. So I think biologicals are going to be the next wave and biologicals are going to, you know, be a sustainable uh, way for us to continue to feed uh, effectively the world. And um, so that's kind of my progression. Um, Nathan, I kid people all the time. I've never really applied for a job, <laughs> maybe my first job. But <laughs> I'm similar. I'm similar. I just wandered into and uh, I have high faith. And so doors kind of open and next chapters or next seasons kind of start. And uh, I've been really fortunate that way. So I'm, I, I think I'm following the to solve a bigger problem, but I don't yet fully understand the mission. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we're all there in life to some extent. So, uh, but yeah, so, so, you know, I'll, I'll skip from the original question. And so from the biological side of things, cause I, I, we're there, you know, and, and, and we were talking a little earlier. So, I mean, and you brought up, you know, in, in the 60s, there's 300 different seed companies and chemical companies. Well, now that now is kind of the biological side. There's like 1,200 or some. I don't even, who even knows what it actually is? is and everyone's doing. Declining each day. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there's a there's a little, uh, uh, the money is, is, is drying up a little bit, but it's getting more focused, probably. Yeah. And the um, solution are getting attached to bigger companies and, and uh, yeah. so 2,600 is the wrong number, right? But that number will coalesce to a right number, a number of that does good things. And ultimately, I think OEMs are looking for solutions and the OEMs will, will be the deliverers of biologicals because they are trusted by the channel, they're trusted by yep. the farmer, and they're trying to displace the current products they have. So the incumbent will will deliver biologicals ultimately. It's just when it's the right time. Well, and and with that, you know, naturally early on in any part of the industry, especially ag, it, you know, it's, you, you're not going to get everything 100% right. I mean, some of the big ones that are out there, you know, like Pivot Bio, whatnot. I mean, it's, it's going after a very large, interesting problem, but I, I, I wonder sometimes if it some if some of these biologicals, you know, they have they have you know they have their results. It's almost like taking a new drug, you know. Oh, this trial we did this, and and these are working. And and I've, I've I'll bring up the story I've, I've written about it before. So like my cousin tried it, and and it's not to call them out or anything. It's just kind of the situation. And I think a lot of other biologicals play into this. Is you know he did a split trial on a field. Great, that's how what people do. And he reduced, you know, his nitrogen by X. And he said, you know, I spent $40 and I saved $80 and it, and it worked for me. But then I, then I started asking, I was like, okay, but did you, did you know how much nitrogen you had in your soil actually, like further down below six inches? Cause in, in most places, that's how deep we go. In North Dakota, many go zero to six, six to 24. I'm like, did it work or did the crop just go find it somewhere else that you weren't aware of what it was sitting? And then also was the trial on the, you're splitting uh, 160 acres. And, and then my dad, he used to farm that, that ground. And he's like, he told my cousin, he's like, Peter, you put the biological on the best part of the field. Of course it was going to do better. <laughs> yes. So our, are we also verifying these things correctly from what you're seeing yeah. to really get into the, the weeds of how it works? Yeah, but, you know, big question. And all of these are big questions. Um, I, I used to do some work with deer and deer has this saying, right questions, right answers, right? So I think all of ag tech and all of agriculture, when we ask the right question, when we're trying to solve the right problem, we can get the answer right. When we start in an opposite way, Right answer, you know, wrong question, we got a problem. Um, and so I, I think some of that, I, I'm a big believer in Pivot Bio from the perspective of they are trying to solve a really big problem that is yep. mandated globally now by different governments, 
I don't think the U.S. yet has taken that stand. But Canada, the EU, is saying to farmers, you can't put that much nitrogen on ne next year or by yeah. this X date. But there's no solution. There's an answer. You must do this. <laughs> but there's no question of how you're going to do this or facilitation of how you're going to do this from that standpoint. So um, companies like Pivot Bio I mean, or any any technology, the first iteration doesn't answer the doesn't get it exactly right, right? Yeah, and you can say yeah. that in precision agriculture. You can say that in seed. You can say, but it, we all kind of forget those, right? The reality is nothing <laughs> works perfectly out of the gate. I, I work no. a, a biological reference, so I, I work. I sit on a family office that uh, has a company called Exacto. Exacto is the leader in adjuvants to the industry, right? Sure. And, and adjuvants make uh, chemical applications better, and I think will play a big role in making biological applications better. I can remember mm -hmm. as a kid following my dad around in Illinois when chemicals failed <laughs> pre-adjuvants. <laughs> and and yes. there's nothing like standing at the end of a turn row with a farmer who says, what the heck happened here? And, mm -hmm. and trying to explain that. And so, again, I think we're in that phase. Uh, or we're always in that phase with technologies as they come forward is answer the right question uh, with the right answer and understand that the first season you, is critical to learn what you're going to do the next seasons, right, from that standpoint. And so, you know, again, I, I think one of the things we do really well in egg, we, we fail fast and we fail and we improve. And that's how agriculture has been a continually really advancing industry as far as technology. We never think we're doing enough, but ag is really, if you if you take a 50-year look or a 30-year look or a 10-year look, man, nobody's doing what they were doing then. No, and I mean, looking back, you know, from, from where our farm was, you know, 40 bushel wheat was like, oh my God, that's that's amazing. And then it's like, now, oh, that's a that's awesome. a poor crop. And and some of it's just genetics, some of it's the chemicals, some it's just people taking care of the ground better. And and even with, you know, from the, the biological side, I think of it too is, you know, in, in a sense right now, it's being embraced much like normal chemistry is, is put this on the field, it equates to X, it kills X weed, it does this. And I've thought, and I've talked to a few about it, but it's hard. There's nothing easy about this, is using more you know, let's call it the, the old ways of, you know, where I grew up around that the site specific ag is putting the right biologicals in the right place, because then you might get more effectiveness out of it. And, and I know that's hard to do. And it's hard for ag retailers to sell that idea and to test that idea. But I think that's, that's almost what the biological sides need to really get past this initial phase is find out where it actually works well, and where it doesn't and kind of fit in there, but it's hard. Great insights, Nathan. I think when we get a few years forward and biologicals are utilized, what we're gonna see, the biggest change we're gonna see is not necessarily the product, but the expectation of how the, what the product will do. Chemicals yeah. kill things dead. It's like, <laughs> yeah, there's, no, there's nothing here, or yeah, the yep. plant looks really good. Biologicals make the outcome better in a whole system approach, but you can't necessarily see that. And so you're the salesman standing there with a farmer. How do you first sell that correctly and manage those expectations? And it's different. It's like, whoa, hold it. And so my watch is saying, I got to go make my next, or I've got to go meet with my next person, or I want to wrap this up and get an order. So the expectations and the playbook will change. We're good in ag in doing that. We've done that before with fertilizers. We've done that before with different way, modes of action with uh, chemicals. We've done that with different uh, approaches with data. So we can change that. We haven't yet come up with a biological playbook at the um, uh, basics level or the distributor mm -hmm. level or the uh, dealer level where a just out of college kid, because that's generally who gets the, the sales position, right? It's like, this is how you sell it. And to have 50 ways to sell something is hard, or 50 products, you want to major in four or five, 
and you want to basically have the same script. Biologicals, for good and for bad, have a different script than ag chemicals, and they have a different outcome, and I think they deliver a, ultimately a different sustainable answer um, yeah. that is being mandated you know, uh, by different governments around the world. So we can all stick our head in the sand and say, not going to work. What you're going to see is in two or three years, someone else made it work. Someone else yeah. put the system together. And that person who said that'll never work, they just lost a lot of market share on their very profitable ag chemicals. So the world always changes for and rewards those people that solve the right problem with the right answer. And uh, so I think you're going to see you're a great marketer. And this is a marketing issue more than a technical issue, I think. Putting it in the right position with the right expectations um, will will deliver uh, will deliver the right results ultimately. Well, and and I think part of the other issue with it too is, and I, I was talking with a, a good ag retail uh, friend of mine who's been in the tech side and has played with a little bit of everything, and they're one of the top ten ag retailers in the country, and. And, and and he kind of made it, an, an, it was kind of an unfortunate statement, and, I, and I've also mentioned this and, and wrote a little bit about it, is their, their Precision Ag program, while successful, is, is limited because that's not where they make a lot of money. And so it's easier to sell seed chemical fertilizer and even their top salesmen he will not work with farmers that use precision ag tech because they make it to, they want it more complicated because they know it's complicated. And so it's, it's been easier for that guy just to sell it to the people that don't want it. And they may, but he makes, he makes more money himself, himself as the entire precision ag program for that ag retailer yeah. individually as a person. Yeah. <laughs> and money. And, and also, you know, you have to think about, do you have your retailer hat on or do you have your farmer hat on? The farmer that's using more precision ag knows more than the yes. dealer selling him the product, right? Because <laughs> he's got actual data on his farm for his acres and multiple years. And so a precision ag farmer has an advantage. It totally shifts the narrative. But back to your point, I'm going to be the most successful dealer I can be. I'm going to go sell the most acres I can with the highest yep. profitable products. Same thing with a deer dealer. I make a whole lot more as a deer salesman selling a combine or a large tractor or a large planter than I do selling the data package. You know, yeah. I don't want to take the time to do that because I don't make any money doing that. We've got to align some of those things. Well, yes. And, you know, okay, that gets back to that original question that I've, you know, we have an adoption issue with this stuff. And, I think it's slowly getting better just because people are getting more used to you know, apps and this stuff. And, and it's become a little bit more of a necessity in certain areas. Uh, internet's better, you know, you, you name it. Uh, integration into OEM stuff is just easier, but we're still kind of lagging behind. And I've, I've been trying to think like, what, what can launch it to that level that we just, that comfortability level or whatever it is. And, and honestly, the, the, the thing, and, and this is what scares people out of it is will that is the only way to do that is, or will it happen through regulation of like, you have to do it or we're government, we pay you to do it. And it, farmers don't want that. We, we know that. And, and ag is scared of regulation. It's spendy, but what else can be done to kind of kick people in the butts to, to utilize it more and, instead of the top 5% of farmers doing it and doing it, you know, how do we get to 50%? Yeah, we're all uh, creatures of habit, right? And, and so yeah. I stand back and say, we need, we need good startups to bring um, a spotlight on a problem today that could be solved today. The bigger companies will ultimately solve that problem but they don't need to solve the problem until it's a real problem or a um, profitable product to <laughs> yes. what they currently sell or their salesperson currently sells from that standpoint. You know, you and I were talking, and North Dakota is a great microcosm. I think Mike, 
North Dakota leads in precision agriculture because you're farming more acres and you have fewer people that need to get things done and you have more um, uh, owners with operators than owners operators. The difference being I'm the owner operator. I'm going to drive, plant, harvest. I'm going to mm -hmm. do it all. You're too busy. You get, you get overwhelmed. Versus I'm going to sit back and I'm going to work with my team or my employees to get it put in, and I'm going to always stay back and above it and looking at it. Uh, you know, I don't know many farmers that call themselves a CEO, but their job is really the chief executive officer. They need to make the right decisions that are financial and agronomic and, um, you know, return on investment and that I can work with the bank on and that I can get the best risk. To... So ultimately, North Dakota is ahead of the curve. And ultimately, you're going to see the same thing in Western Canada as we were talking about. Technology drives ability to scale. But what it really drives mm -hmm. is ability to scale profitably or ability to get a return on investment um, from that perspective. And so some of that is some farms can still do it the old-fashioned brute force way. Well, they got the, they got the champagne yeah. soils. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's... Yeah. But to your point, you know, how you will farm your farm versus how your farm was farm, farmed before is different. That doesn't mean your dad was right or wrong or your uncles were right or wrong. It just means you're going to take a different approach. Some technology items need somebody who says, I, this is a more valuable tool to me than my vice grip, right? And, and that's a generational change. Mm -hmm. Both have technology applications but massively different app, uh, uh, optimization to a problem, right? And ability to scale versus do. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. And, and, and it's something I do see more often just working in. It's kind of weird. I've, I've worked with farms and, and groups in, in Western Canada a lot just because there's a lot of similarities and you know we're, we're on the border and whatnot. And it's like things trickle down from there and a technology wise, they'll, they'll adopt it faster for all of those reasons you just said. And, and yeah, other, other areas of the, the country are, are slower just for they're smaller or they're, you know, they're more, I'm, I'm the one all person on the farm. And, and it's, it's, it's to do up here. It's, it's more of a necessity because well, time too. It's like, you got, you got four months to put something in, and for it to grow and to maybe be successful. And you you have to pre-plan so much of things and the more data and information and tools you use, the more you can pre-plan and other areas have, they can do it slower maybe, uh, you know, the warmer the climate, I guess, maybe that's part of it. And, uh, but I, I, another part of that I, I get concerned too is while maybe more my generation, people younger than me are, are more adapt to use some of these tech, one thing I've been hearing too is they're not also being educated on some of the other core systems in ag from, you know, people that have been in it for 30 years and some of those guys are getting out. I mean, the next 20 years, I mean, heck, five, 10 years of the people retiring from different ag retail groups, from input companies, machinery, agronomy, banks, crop insurance, you name it, government systems that information and knowledge that they have acquired that is very useful you know people people like you isn't getting as passed down as much as maybe needed i know there's a there's a worry about that and is is that going to hold back yeah. some of this progression Think about his system of systems was here and in a little pocket notebook and with his mm -hmm. banker and with his you know few people who he bought products from that was his system of systems Today, your system of systems is global. It's what your computer yeah. can reach. It's what your phone can connect to. And you can not only plan, but you can manage. And, and you can, at the end of the season, look at and say, we were talking about, you know, best part of the field, worst part of the field. You know, you can analyze that. You can look at, is that a right answer? Is that a wrong answer? For us in agriculture to do great things, whether it's, biologicals from your biosciences or whether it's it's other items we have to move forward with data 
so that we can unharness things like AI so that we can stand back at the end and say, hmm, let me think really hard about what I did right and what I did wrong versus say, hey, give me a give me a feedback on this, which AI systems look, learn, mm -hmm. tell you what to do. Right or wrong, they're not fully autonomous and ready to go yet. But our ability in ag to, again, or someone like you, ability to move forward and have a differential advantage over your neighbor is going to be your data quality to make better decisions and informationally driven decisions. Today, we've got a lot of data, but it's not good data in ag, and it's not well yeah. orchestrated, and it's not put together in ways that it can be utilized. That, that to me, you know, again, living a life in, in ag and at 65 looking at ag right now, our greatest limiting factor is we're not harnessing and utilizing the data we have or putting a high enough priority on the data we have to not look at, to manage, but to look at, to change and make better results going forward. Or even say, I'm, I'm going to totally change this next year, right? And that's what, that's what we're going to compete against, I think, in areas. And I think you're going to see a lot of that coming out of Brazil. Brazil is going to move from where they yeah, are yeah. to a level because, you know, it's 22 big farms and they're going to do their <laughs> the owner operator is going to stand back and say, everybody's doing it this way and this fleet of combines going across and we're going to take that data and we're going to feed it into AI and powerful global partners are going to say, look what they're doing. That's going to be an advantage. Yes. Very scary, maybe. But those are changes yeah. that I see right now happening around the world. Well, and that's a that's a great point. And two parts to that. So, you know, from from people, you know, getting out of ag or whether, you know, retiring or whatever, even if, you know, there's a fear of, like I said, that that, you know, call it brain drain. But at the same time, that might be the trigger that gets others to dive more into tech because they're like, well, I guess my old boss just didn't want to pass down what he learned. I got to relearn all this. Oh, there's all this data that was not utilized. I'm going to go look back at it and, and look through it. It, it almost, and, and that might happen, you know, even from governmental things, from reporting, you know, the old way of, you know, paper or here's these rules, it'll force a change. Be like, oh, well, you know, if this happens all the next 20 years, the USDA is half the people it used to be maybe. Oh, we have to use these new technology tools to actually do the reporting and and the way that people want. Maybe not, but then to the, your last point there, and and I've talked more and more about this, and I'm hearing more people talking about it. Other countries are stepping up the game faster with adoption with technology than we are. We're, yeah, some are doing good things, but Brazil, great point. Are they're increasing and it's cheaper to do things there and i was talking with um some people from you know on the california side of ag and like acres are leaving there left and right going to peru or to africa where there is a plethora of people you can hire for 10 bucks a day <laughs> and and it's it's going to change so much of the dynamics here in the u.s and you know we, we talk about you know, corn and beans so much, but yeah, Brazil's changed that market. You know, we, we wanted the growth trend to be like, oh, we should be making $10, $10 a bushel for corn. It's like, well, because of Brazil, we're still making the same, but we're producing more. And, you know, ethanol is going to last forever. Like it's, it, there is some scary conversations that need to be had on, on where things actually go versus what people want them to be that traditional US ag family stuff. <laughs> yeah. And and I think we have many advantages that we can apply and we need to apply them in in the US across our industries, across our government and to stay a leader, right? I worry we're falling behind in uh US agriculture because we're not exporting as much because we're not utilizing mm -hmm. that as a basic business tool of the country to manage our deficits. And that's not good for uh, American agriculture. And the opportunities no. are just put your eye back on the ball, right? There's opportunities that I, I was, I mentioned to you, I just been in Asia for three and a half weeks. I had a chance to see 
the good, the bad, the ugly, but a lot of great things. I was really impressed. My biggest technology versus traveling from the U.S. to Asia, I entered Singapore. I never talked to anybody. I, I, my passport was scanned. This could be good and bad. My passport was scanned. <laughs> I took a picture of my face, right? And I uh, entered. I didn't talk to anybody. Now, I can tell you there were people standing there with an iPad looking at the tablet of me mm-hmm. popping up and knowing that I, you know, wasn't a, wasn't a threat, quote unquote. But um, I came back into the U.S. for customs. It took us two and a half hours to clear customs. Yeah. We're not utilizing technology correctly. If we utilize technology correctly, we will continue to be the pace setter around the world. And we will continue Agreed. to have a cost advantage versus other around the world. And we'll lead the sustainability factors of doing it the right way versus just saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. We have to have solutions to what we can do, and they need to be the right solutions um, that work for the farmer and work for the distributor and work for the, you know, basic food market that consumers work with. Well, and yeah, and I, I, I agree fully on that as that we, we need to almost tie some of the tech to the, to our end commodity because we're, we're not doing that as much, but that's our advantage right now with with all the infrastructure and and stuff we can do of course there's a fear about that and that comes into some of the you know called data privacy thing a reason why we're not scanning you know coming back into the country is that there's a fear there's this in in innate fear that the government's going to do all these things to me where in other countries and maybe right or wrong governments be like no we need this I'll you know we can't help you with all these other programs and systems here we have this fear of like we we want this independence that's what we're built on this independence and i think that in ag is it, it reflects that too is oh well i'll i'll farm the way i farm because i've been a farm the way i farm and i don't want this person that person to have all this data because of of a fear of losing independence but we're actually losing it by not yeah. doing it you in a sense you mentioned some foreign foreign markets and i think they are more connected one of the things i always love about north dakota and it's maybe because you're all related in one way or another uh, <laughs> north dakota farmers work together north dakota farmers solve solutions together if i go to a lot of other corn belt states it's like no i'm competing against my neighbor i'm competing against that neighbor i don't want to tell him anything it's a win-lose. I want to win. I want them to lose. That isn't a winning long-term formula. And and Argentina and Brazil, they're they're formally sharing. Here's what we did. Here's our financials. Here's what we did. How, you know, what'd you see? What you and the, so they're learning at a faster cycle. Things like biologicals mm-hmm. get adopted much quicker right now in Brazil because they're sharing what's happening. We're yeah. we're kind of like. Hold it. We're playing poker here. I'm not yeah, secret cards and yeah. because I'm going to win and you're going to lose. That's not a great long. Um, that's not a good long game. That's not a perpetual long game of uh, being the industry leader, I believe, or the global leader. Well, and 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 one of the reasons it's it's a little better to your point up here is we definitely have more of a, a, a co-op yeah. based kind of process like. I, from other states, some, some different agri tests are like, why, why is in North Dakota, why is there like a hundred different little elevators and things? It's like co-ops, man. And, and they're like, and that, that's not as prolific or everywhere else. Although some co-ops are getting almost too big for their own good of being actual co-ops. But why that happened is, is a very actually interesting story and why it's unique here. And I think other whether this can happen or not politically or not, because that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing is back in, I think it was the twenties or thirties. Basically the, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, which is controlling wheat prices was doing just that. And all the politicians at the state at the time were kind of on board with that. They're like, Oh yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll do grain. Well, then a bunch of farmers got pissed. Yeah. They said, well, I'm going to run for office. And they did. They took over the entire state. It's called the NPL, yeah. Nonpartisan League. 
And because of that, then they created something that right now seems impossible. They created a state owned mill where the state owned it and you could get the right grain prices. And then that mill would, would distribute out and then a state bank so that you could centralize and, you know, bring, give the money where it's needed and, and in, and in a fair way. And it's a very kind of socialistic type approach. Of course, that now is honestly like it's the state kind of becomes a, a hypocrisy jungle as that's the last thing they want, but then they praise the, <laughs> that whole process too. Um, but I can see other countries d- doing that in a sense more, or it's, it's easier because of that collectiveness and we, yeah, we're, we're getting scared of working together and it is kind of, it can be scary because there's so much more information out there. You're like, Oh, they're going to know all my stuff. I'm like, I don't know. Everyone knows everyone's stuff these days, whether you like it or not, it's just how you use it. it Exactly. Right. You're a thought leader in agriculture. And so you can shape some of these changes. The systems we built in the 20s were built because of oversupply and and, you know, depressed prices and so forth. Is that Mm -hmm. the right system 100 years later? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Yeah. Uh, And we have vastly different ways to uh, to um, work those systems today from that standpoint. We just need to apply those. And, you know, it's it's big and it's a it's a system of systems it's very interconnected right value creation mm-hmm. isn't what i can do with my poker hand it's what i can do within my systems of systems and plugging into those right relationships that will ultimately help me and i always tell people would you rather have more data or less data and you have to give to get and so if you give mm-hmm. your data, what will you get back? And what will you know from that perspective? Um, I, I, think there's, I think there are good things. A great article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal about um, uh, insurance prices on cars are going up because mm-hmm. when, I, when I sign to have my OnStar on my truck, I can use OnStar. It's like, great, yeah. yeah, if I had a crash of... But OnStar can now share my data, and they are sharing my data with insurance companies. So every time I go, you know, 75 versus 70, that's yep. recorded. And, and so that's an example of, ba- of sharing data in a bad way. There are ways, though, that data can help make a better truck, make a better, you know, uh, system. Yep. Tell me I'm about to have a breakdown ahead of time, quote, unquote. Um, those are all good things or stop me before I even know I need to stop. Right. So there's always trade-offs. Well, and that, yeah, my pickup will, will, uh, I got a 23 and it, it'll say, oh, you're, you're this percentage of, you know, breaking or accelerating slowly. And, and, and I don't look at it a lot, but it almost kind of, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I'm that guy that like slows down a mile ahead of time. So I don't use my brakes yep. or I'll, I'll slowly accelerate. I've become kind of the, the, the quintessential old man driving. I'll just putz around. I don't, I don't care. You know, when you're younger, it's different, <laughs> but you know, it, on, on the ag perspective, I, it, it's, it's, it's weird in a sense. Cause we want to compare ourselves to our neighbors and how we're doing better. Yet sometimes some of the groups that have come out with ways to do that, they're chastised. Like you can't do that. It's like, but you want to know that information you're talking about it at the coffee shop. Don't you want real data that actually proves it? Or are we living in this? Like we have the social experiment nag, why aren't we utilizing that to the full degree of, of how comparing ourselves to each other when you're doing it anyways, why not do it better and yeah. really prove it? If we have 18,000 farms in the U S that are producing more than 85% of the value in the U S those 18,000, if they were collectively working together, thinking about that, learning from what their data is and working with those suppliers to them, the OEMs, the distributors, the dealers, our systems would advance and we would have great advantage from that standpoint. Instead, we have 
you know, ag has always been defined as an industry with five to seven silos, right? And the silos are defined that way because it's advantageous to a big company, maybe hypothetically like a Cargill, to control or understand their area and mm -hmm. not be able to see the whole data. The ability to see things like most industries see things could be really powerful for agriculture. And I think we're beginning to see the early stages of that, primarily because we have now have the technology to do that, right? And cost effectively mm -hmm. in real time do that. Cargill and ADM and companies like that have done great things the, because that's the, how the system needed to evolve 100 years ago. The reality is we're in different systems now. We have different consumers. We have different needs. And the ability for us to connect in our systems of systems as growers or ag companies and play a role that advances agriculture, I think is a is a great opportunity. And I I I don't I'm not criticizing ADM or or card going that. <laughs> I'm just saying you know everybody has a yeah. business model and everybody has a has a focus and the ability to do good. They've done tremendous good, right? The ability to next chapter, what will it be? We'll see, but there are always groups that will break away like good North Dakota farmers to say, hey, hey, this isn't working. Hey, and that's a good balance. We're, we're trying. Um, well, and, and to that point, what's interesting is, I mean, clearly with, I mean, just doing this podcast or people putting on, you know, there's, there's tons of people actually being open and talking about their experiences. You look at some of the farmers, there's, a, you know, the millennial farmer, Larson's Farms and and they're sharing the total experience. And, you know, before, uh, if you broke down, the tractor broke down or or the crop wasn't good, I mean, you wouldn't tell anybody about that yep. because uh, I don't want to, I just, I don't want to tell people that something didn't work or I failed here or there, you know, to that earlier point, you know, we fail fast, but we don't necessarily want to tell people about it or how that happened. That is starting to shift with other farms and people saying, oh, this is how I'm doing it. Like, I, I can't control the weather. It This has happened. Or combine broke down and it cost me $10,000 to fix. It's a reality. And that is shifting. I wonder if it can shift fast enough to to keep the trend going without it harming us. In, in, in certain ways, because I, I know one thing I was speaking at and, and I scared a whole room full of uh, farm equipment dealers because, you know, they're so integral to kind of jump starting some of the stuff, yep. you know, from a technology standpoint. And they're not doing it. Now, some OEMs are doing better than others and, and everyone knows what, what that is. But I said to him, I was like, I was like, if you guys don't take heed of this stuff other groups are going to kind of force it through other channels. And, and I said, it's like, you might be scared of, Oh, Monsanto having this data or John Deere having this data or Cargill or whatever. I was like, you guys are thinking too small. Where is all your data right now? It's in Google, it's in Amazon, it's in Apple and it's in Microsoft. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, you don't even know. Now are they doing malefic or bad things with it? No, or yes, there's no way of knowing or doing anything, but they know what technology took and how it increased their businesses by trillions, more or less. They're going to come in and trickle down in some way where they see, to, not saying they want to take advantage, but they see where data can be powerful and make their businesses grow and make their products better and more efficient. It's like, if you can own that better, if you work collectively with your growers, with your with people in your dealership network to hone this in more. Otherwise, you might get you might get caught into something that your your data is getting somewhere anyways. Yeah. It's just you're not in the driver's seat of where that data can help you. Yeah. It's being used almost for you to follow a plan instead of you creating a plan using data. Yeah. I think we're in a real sea change right now in ag manufacturing um, machines, right? So think about what Deere has invested in. That's what you do as a leader. You figure things out ahead of time and whatever. Now Agco and now CNH, the moves that have been made in the last 12 to 18 months 
acquiring uh, a Raven, acquiring a Trimble or JVing with a Trimble, now bring those tools to a bigger platform and a bigger opportunity. And the question really is, do you do the same thing as Deer or do you do something different? And your mm -hmm. point is exactly right. It's coming through your machine, but you have no idea compared to Amazon or compared to Google yep. or compared to, and for American agriculture, you know, and it's probably different in eggs and dairy and some of the areas yep. that are more right. integrated, but those companies are very definitely entering the food market or the food chain and understanding yes. the food chain better than the people in the food chain because they're oh, yes. yep. top to bottom. And, and that's what we need to do more as a, as an ag industry is embrace, embrace utilizing data and embrace putting uh, intelligence to work from that perspective, because that'll drive biological success. That'll drive the next level of seed success. It'll drive the next robotics is a great, you know, robotics will be in North Dakota more than anywhere else because you've got vast acres. And you don't have enough people yeah. to run machinery. And so robotics will come in. The question is, what do you learn in the first couple of years of robotics to make it even better? Well, the company running the robot will know better than the farmer, maybe, if you don't pay attention. Yeah, and I, I, I was on a, uh, another uh, podcast from um, a group out of, uh, out of Australia, New Zealand, the other the other week. And uh, we... we the guy was out of New Zealand is like, is there a lot of billionaires, you know, moving there because of, you know, the up upcoming apocalypse or they just have too much money and they're, they're just trying to be safe and, you know, do what every human normally does. Everyone wants a bunker or whatever. And he was saying that. And then I, I was, I was kind of thinking of it as I, if the end of the world comes or some big thing, you know, something bigger than what COVID was and, and all that, and I have to, you know, everything changes. Well, I'm going to probably move back to where I grew up on our farm because I know my neighbors. There's a community there. We have our big, beautiful church that, you know, people collective just meet at, at the very least. They know me. I know them. I'm going to get through hard times by working with them. Or I can be in the mindset like some of the billionaires and say, I'm going to build this big bunker and I'm just going to stay in it to feel safe. When actually that's the probably worst place you want to be because then you're targeted. Yeah. And, and I, was, I was trying to kind of bring that as an analogy is that's kind of what can happen if you, you're building a bunker, you're holding all your data, you're saying, I'm, I'm on my own island of farm. Like, fine, you can survive that way, but you're becoming a target then to be taken advantage of because you're not working together with others. And, and you're a Polaroid picture frozen in time. And yeah. nobody knows Polaroid anymore or Kodak anymore because they bunker. It's like, this yep. is what we do. I, that's why I say, I think we're in a really different place with the machinery companies and the data because they cross every acre and they can do a lot with that information, a lot to help their customer with that information, the farmer from that perspective. But business models have to change. And then the question is, is the ag retailer the value point for the farmer or is the ag manufacturer with the equipment? That, and that's a that's a brand, Yeah, that's, that's, a brand, that's tough. That's uh, coming reality. If you look at it as a system, a system of we'll help you with this, you help us with that. All of us stay in what we do best. It creates great, great return on investment for everybody. And it's a all boats rise. <laughs> Yeah, I when I was in crop insurance, I I was I was trying to get. I think every little community needs its kind of leaders with you know, especially around data and ag. And in that, um, you know, my my old boss was kind of teaching me this process. And as I was meeting crop insurance agents, I was like, "Geez, they could become these data stewards. They don't have to do everything, but they already have all this data that's." private and they're 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 strict to like sitting in their guns but they need to own more of being a data steward than just like selling insurance or 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 managing it and then you know others need to step up too 
you know, ag agronomists need to do a little bit more. The dealers need to do a little bit more. The, the seed guy needs to do a little bit more to get all this working. Like we need to see those opportunities more. And to do a little bit more, you got to do a lot less. So you have to change. And, and that's yes. the greatest impediment, right, to really changing. Um, because I know how to do this. I'm pretty good. I'm good. I may not be great, but I'm good. I can do this. Versus I, I have no idea how to operate that. The insurance industry has not been computerized enough in my mind. No. They if it were more computerized, the data would be there, and you'd be able to say, hey, Here's the opportunity. Um, and and really, there are many opportunities, right? And many change. And, you know, the 2080 rule, 20% 20 of the people always create 80% of the output and the value. The 20 percenters are changing. Those mm -hmm. people are adopting. The reality is if you're in that 80% producing 20%, you have to change your business model because you're going out of business and you don't even know it yet. And it's not yeah. sustainable. And for most of us, we want to sustain and do good. And I think that's the that's the opportunity across agriculture. And and quite honestly, that's the opportunity in election year for us <laughs> to get politics yeah. right. Because I don't think we're doing politics right at all. And I'm not taking any kind of uh, view. <laughs> Just no, it, it's it's a it's a mess. It, it's okay to say it's a mess. <laughs> and. We are the envy of the world in some ways over the time I traveled globally for 40 years. And now when I travel, they go, what the heck is going on in the U.S.? Because CNN is global and, and yeah. Fox is now global. And I go, yeah, we're going through a patch. We shouldn't go through a patch. We we should lead, always lead. Yeah, this this there's a lot, a lot, a lot at stake here. But I, I do see. I see shimmers of hope. I do too. In in a lot of places, and you know, we're yeah, we're going through a rough patch. Maybe we're going. I, you could call it either we're 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 either going through our major phase or our awkward college phase. We're going through a phase, or maybe it's our midlife crisis. I don't know. <laughs> I I would hope it's earlier than later me, uh, in the in me, no, everything. We, but we did when the world was in meltdown with COVID. The U.S. did amazing things. U.S. companies did amazing things. Um, they not only survived, we need to yeah. take that kind of speed and initiative and uh, coalition approach to solve the issues that we can identify, but we're largely ignoring them and largely debating about them and politicizing them. And so COVID, to me, is a great, it's a terrible thing, um, but it mm -hmm. is a great blueprint for we can get things right fast we can do regulatory fast we can get approvals fast and right now we're not getting faster we're getting slower on the yes yep. agriculture yeah it, it was a it was a testament to let's just get past our bullshit and let's get some stuff done because it's needed to be done and i I hope it can maybe get to that. Maybe, maybe the, you know, just like in ag, you know, there, there's, there's large cultural transitions that are going to happen in the next 10, 20 years, whether we like it or not. And there's a, there's a lot of different reasons that is maybe it'll naturally happen, but we have to be more aware of how we're going to deal with that transition than just crossing our legs and our, our being our stubborn self. And that, that's maybe the biggest thing here in North Dakota we have a problem with. We're very stubborn Germans and Norwegians. Uh, so there is that. It does happen. But, you know. I would, I would <laughs> say keep doing what you're doing. You're a thought leader. You shine a light on things we need to do better, things that are problems, things that when some of your newsletters, it's like, wow, I'm laughing well, out loud at that. But that's the reality. Other thought leaders who read your information can act. We all need to act. We all need to say we can change this. We can make this continue to make this the greatest place in the world and the greatest systems in the world and the ability to continue and sustain the world. And those are things that you play a big role in. Well, well, I appreciate that, Kip. And uh, we're getting near the end of time. And, and I know you got a you got a hard stop here. Um, any kind of last thoughts around 
just technology and ag in general or what what you're most hopeful for being I mean, we're talking a lot about, about that but any just kind of main big trigger parts at the end here rule of three right if if you're working in agriculture work with others right you can't do it alone um, secondly data pull your data together and apply your data learn from your data and if you've got lousy data there's the only person who can fix it is you the last thing is Know what you're trying to do. What is the value you're trying to create? What is your why? Why do you exist? Why do you, what is the problem, the why that you're solving? Mm -hmm. If you do those three things, I think American agriculture is amazing. And I think anybody working in agriculture, whether you're on the farm or in a dealership or working for an OEM, if you take that basic view, you will be ahead of the pack and you will be like you leading others to the things we need to be doing. Well, uh, we'll end that on a high note. <laughs> uh, uh, so li listen to, listen to Kip and, and uh, to, to his point, keep following, uh, subscribe to my ag uncensored podcast. I got a lot of other stuff coming out, so uh, it's going to, it's going to be interesting and fun, but uh, thanks everyone for, for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Look forward to your other podcasts. Yeah. Thanks, Kip.